All right, are you able to see that? Yes. Yep. Nice little colored ball. Which has the same structure as a classical gyroscope, except that the spin wheel is a permanent magnet or rotor. Can you hear that at all? Uh, it yes. just sounds like a mumble. Okay, that, that's what I was afraid of. So um, I'll just turn the volume down on the, on the, on the video. Yeah, so this, this is kind of a, this looks like a kind of a classical gyroscope, but the spin wheel is actually a permanent magnet. Uh, otherwise, it's identical to a, a simple gyroscope. You, you have three hoops in that thing, right? Um, well, it's actually, there, there's three axes of rotation. There, there's um, the spin wheel is on a separate axis. You can see the bearing right there. Right. And then the pink hoop can spin at 90 degrees of that. And the green hoop can spin at a 90 degree offset from that. And the clear plastic shell is a frame where it doesn't, it doesn't. So, so right. it's actually, yeah, there's two hoops, but there's actually three axes of, of rotation. Okay. And I'm just going to place it between two coils. And now I can treat it like an electric motor. Uh, and that, this, I, now I can get it spinning. So, that, so now it's actually, I'm going to pull it out of the, of the coils. And now it's just going to behave as a, a normal gyroscope and the axis or, orientation kind of maintains itself. There's a little bit of drift because it's starting to slow down a bit. That, that's just a, a slide of what it, what it looks like. Um, so now at this, at this point, so the, the rotor is spinning. And I'm going to keep the coils in place. So if, if you think of the, the axis of the coils where the magnetic field is generated, right now it's perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Right. And so as long as I don't change that offset angle, the rotor doesn't have any precession or not any movement. So here, here I'm just rotating the coils around the axis of rotation, and there's no real impact on the rotor. In a moment, I'm going to actually now change the angle to something less than 90 degrees. And when I start doing that, you notice now there's a precession being introduced on the um, spin wheel. Oh yeah, it is precessing. Yes. And it'll continue to do that, you know, and it's basically a function of the angle offset between the axis of the coils and the spin plane of the rotor. So, and, and, so now in the following slides, you know, so yeah, this is just, you know, what I mean by precession. So there's a, the axis, a virtual axis, you know, is a green dash but it can process around a kind of a cone around that axis. And that, and that precession can kind of be small or large depending on uh, what the coils configuration is. So in the next few little video clips, I'm using a more complicated coil arrangement. Yeah, so here now, this is a eight coil design. Holy moly. And so it's a large precession um, the, the rotor is spinning pretty fast, so that there are, what, what I'll be showing is a number of different setups. So th this is just another example, but in this case, there's a lot of hoop action, and I can't really tell what, what the rotor is doing. So in, in the next couple of videos, I'm going to, I've used a high-speed camera, and I've slowed down the motion to 1 40th of real time. And there's about six or seven clips. And what I want you to focus on is the actual movement pattern of the hoops. Because they're, they're very particular patterns that result. You know, and they're random. It's, I have to start up the motor with a kickstart to get it going. And when it starts operating, it spins in different ways. To, it's kind of random. But I'll, I'll, let me play this forward. In this case, I've got, yeah, the, the, in this case, the green coils 
are generator coils. So they're kind of like they pick up the magnetic flux of a spinning rotor. And the red coils act as a motor coil that are driven by the audio amplifier to create four different magnetic fields because there's four red coils. All right, so, so this is now the high speed camera. And yeah, the, the two things I wanted you to focus on is the hoop movement of the pink and green hoops, and then the speed of the rotation of the rotor. It's going to vary from the different examples I'm going to show. So this is kind of a you know a fairly tight procession, and the green and pink hoops oscillate back and forth about you know one configuration that results. The next one should start soon. So it is very similar, but now we've got a a wider procession. Uh, the rotor is spinning a little bit slower, you know, and, and the hoops make a little bit of a wider oscillation. Do you have any way you can me measure the revolutions per minute on that thing? Yeah, yeah, I, I could measure that with an oscilloscope, um, you know, or or I know what the, I know what the frame rate is. I can a number of ways I can calculate it. But now, just, okay. just so I just you look at the relative speed change um, is what I. What was the output voltage of the amplifier to the coils? It's a, it's a 12 volt audio amp. So it's like a you know maximum 12 volt. It, it, are, are you able to vary voltage up and down or current up and down? I, I could. If, if, I, if I increase the voltage, then I increase the speed of the. Correct. Of, yep, correct, yeah. correct. It's, it, yes, it's directly. I wonder. I wonder how that would play in a weightless environment because you have the effects of gravity working on the system. Yeah, that, that, that would, um, yeah, definitely would have an impact. Um, in fact, that's a good question because the two of the main influences I, I'm focusing on that influence the movement is the, um, where the coils are located um, and how the coils are paired up because you know, one coil, they come in pairs. So it's a generator and motor coil pair. But on this design, I can put them on any of the eight faces of the octahedron and get different results. And then the other big influence is the <coughs> design of the hoops, whether I'm using a 90 degree offset, a 60 degree offset, or how many hoops I use, I get different results. Now, in this case, actually, now the green hoop is doing full revolutions and the pink hoop is doing like half revolutions. So it's, it's starting now, it is a whole different flavor of movement. Um, you know, the, the rotor is slowed down a bit um, and it's a very wide procession. Is that rotor a magnet? Yeah. So okay. that- The permanent and, and magnet? Per, yeah, it's a cylinder magnet. And the poles are located on the surface of the of, of the other, you know. So this blue dot is a north pole or south pole. Okay. But it's not the typical cylinder magnet where you got the magnetic poles on the circular edges or, or you know, top and bottom. Uh huh. So your your permanent magnets are perpendicular to the uh, to the rotor shaft. Yes. Yeah. You have four, two magnets on the, on the rotor, one on south, one on north. You mean like, could I? No, do you have that? Is a uh, magnet a solid magnet all the way through the rotor? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a solid cylinder magnet, yeah. All the way through the rotor, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I just got sort of tape and stuff around it just for illustration purposes. But yeah, it's a solid, very strong magnet. Okay, just trying to understand. And I think the next, so th this one is similar, but not, now the, the pink hoop is doing I mean, a little bit more than 180 revolutions. Are those uh, revolutions integral multiples of each other? Yeah. Like it's, it's very cyclic. I mean, it's sort of. No, like is one going four times and one going two times and all that? You know, I, I haven't counted it, but there's, um, 
I, I, that I, I can't say for sure. I tell you because sure, actually, now, now this next one, it actually, the green hoop will be doing full revolutions, and the pink hoop does about 300 degree rotation clockwise, and then goes 300 degrees counterclockwise, and kind of goes back and forth, but in a very rhythmic pattern. This, which I found interesting. Is this still the slowed down version? Yeah, you, these are all slowed down by 40 times. Okay. And, and, and if you look at the relative rotation of the rotor with respect to its pink hoop that it's mounted to, it's, it's going kind of slower than the hoops are now, right? So now the hoops are dominating the rotation. And the rotor itself is just sort of tumbling around. But it's, it's, a, it's a very re repetitive pattern. I wonder what the angular force is there. Yeah. Now this one, yeah, so now the green hoop has kind of a stop and go sort of movement. Um, and the pink hoop is doing some full revolutions, but it's, it's, I can't say there's a real pattern to this one, but it, it, it does have, you know, again, and the rotor itself is, is barely spinning. And I think that the next example is even a, a, bit, a more of an exaggeration of this. Yeah, so now you look at the, either the, the blue dot or the yellow dot, the, the rotor is almost floating in space here. You know, it's, which was kind of puzzling because for this whole, for the, for the, um, for the, for the magnetic field to work, the rotor has to be moving. Like the magnetic field has to cut through the coils to generate a current in the coil. And if it's not moving, then the audio amplifier should be driving anything out. So that that had that had me. I'm still a bit puzzled on on that one. So is it taking two two revolutions for the the hoops for the central magnet to switch? Say it's switching poles. Yeah, yeah. There's a bit of a. It's it's not, it's not always two, but it's. You know, and for, and for this last couple of seconds, that, that yellow dot is, hasn't moved much, right? It, it doesn't look like it's a reproducible pattern that, uh, you know, would be exactly the same result. Yeah, the, 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 there is, yeah, there is some randomness. Um, it, it, it's more the well, trend. At least you haven't defined an exact pattern that, that is reproducible. It hasn't played through long enough. Well, yeah, how long would it take to get a reproducible pattern? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's similar, no doubt it's similar, but is it exactly the same? Yeah, this is more of a chaotic movement, really. And yeah. there's, there's just less of a pattern to this one. Um, let me, um, yeah, but what, what was, you know, if I look at that last, you know, pattern of movement, with the with the magnetic rotor not really moving, it's just sort of getting bounced around a little bit. And normally, if if that would happen, the motor would stop. You know, so if, just because it's not cutting through the electric coil on the generator side to produce enough current for the amplifier to see and drive its output on the motor coil. So I, I'm only speculating that what could, could be a secondary effect that the coils themselves are now have a transformer effect between adjacent coils. So there could, it could be a runaway effect that's just bouncing around between coils in the feedback loop and the magnets just responding to it by wobbling around. Um, yeah. And it, I, it's hard to capture that on a oscilloscope. So it's, I haven't been able to prove it, but just by looking at the little motion on the rotor, what else could be causing but for, in order for those hoops to do like almost two spins, you know, faster than the rotor is, there's got to be torque being applied 
to that rotor to cause that gyroscopic thing. And if there's a runaway effect with a transformer effect between the adjacent coils, that could explain it. Are are there aren't there magnets in the in the rings? No. No. The, the only magnet is that that center rotor, that cylinder. In fact, I'm using ceramic bearings. I'm using non-ferrous material. You know, so the so the movement of the rings is just momentum. Well, it's it's kind of a, a torque on the shaft of the rotor. So, so the, the rotor is connected to that pink hoop, and if you went in there and kind of twisted it, you know, the the two hoops would have to correspond, you know, to compensate for that movement. So it's that's that's where it, that's where the that's where the angular force is being gotcha. expressed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, oh, okay. Because the example I have has magnets. I assume there were magnets in there. That changes everything. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. What if complete... you changed? What if you substituted the coils with actual uh, magnets at that at that distance? Uh, well, yeah. Then, then it, would, it would it would kind of settle at one point. Because right? it's not. It would be a static magnetic configuration right so, so what's interesting here is a way of explaining it it's kind of a it's in a feedback loop so as the rotor it, the rotor needs movement that's why i have to give it a kick start to get things going that moving field cuts through the generator coils and it knows that what polarity it is it says all right so i'm going to make this in this direction that gets amplified and the and the output of the, of the amplifier drives a motor coil with a larger magnetic field. And now the rotor is going to respond to it. And I could do one of two things. I can make that the, the direction of the motor coil go in clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's either going to attract the North Pole or repel it. Right? So we're going to do, and that's why I could configure this thing in many, many different ways by what direction the winding of the coil is and where it's positioned on one of the eight faces of the octahedron. So I, it's completely random. So I, I, I can't predict what it's going to do, but it needs movements to keep everything going. And, and it's almost the same thing if you think of, if I had four microphones pointing together and four speakers pointing together, the kind of feedback you'd get in an audio amplifier, you know, when you bring a microphone close to a speaker, well, that same thing would happen here and that squeal, that frequency would represent how fast that rotor is spinning. So that's the analogy between how you can use an audio amplifier. In the simpler designs, I just use two coils. One's a generator, one's a motor coil. And when I spin the rotor, you know, the generator coil picks up a signal. The motor coil now creates a, 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 the opposite field to attract the rotor to it. Now, when it gets there, it switches and it just keeps on switching and attracting, repelling, attracting, repelling. And if I just go in and stop the rotor, it stops dead. You know, it, it won't burn itself out. It's just no movement, no drive. It's a more complex now because I've got four pairs of coils, a different, you know, size of the octahedron, and it's just responding randomly. And although, when you look at it, it's not random in many cases, right? There was a predictable pattern of back and forth of the, the, the hoops going back in a certain way. You know, the, the rotor was kind of somewhat synchronous to it to some extent, but then the slower the rotor started spinning, the more effect that the hoops had freedom to move around. And initially I thought it would have been a random pattern, but in many times it's a very predictable motion looks very rhythmic yeah yeah and it's and it'll stay that way for for quite some time I mean, it sometimes goes in and out of two different phases I mean, if, if you watch it real time it's a blur right you really can't see what's but you'd hear the sound go kind of like oscillate between you know what, maybe a what, little bit of precession what frequencies are you driving your coils at i assume you're running alternating current uh well it, it's actually it's a, it's a dc amplifier oh 
And the frequency is just determined by the system. So it depends on how many windings of coil I have, you know, what the impedance of the coil is. It, it'll, it's, it spins at anywhere between 10 to 20 Hertz and, and 50 Hertz is pretty easy to achieve without, you know, I, I can, I can get a, to run much faster if I just want to focus so, on the So speed. this is kind of like feedback of the magnetic field. Yes, the exactly. Coils? Yes. Yeah, oh. that's exactly this, this it. Is pulsating DC. Yeah, it's it's um. What the, the, the DC, the, the, the amplifier is is powered with, by twelve volts DC, but the output's going to look like a sine wave. Okay. So it's AC. Yeah. <laughs> it's AC, but the zero yeah. is the lowest point. It doesn't go below zero. Yeah, it goes between twelve and minus, you know, between zero and twelve. Yeah, zero and twelve. That still makes it AC, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. It's a form of AC, but but it's not an AC motor. No, it's not a not an AC induction motor. So it's actually you, you, you don't see this motor out. It's not a common motor design. It's um, I'd say well, you it's very have two uncommon. Fields. <laughs> you have two different non-aligned fields, unaligned. That's not the usual motors. <laughs> Did you measure, is there a way for you to measure the angle of the precession? Because when I watched it operating, it reminded me of Earth's orbital, orbital precession. So I was wondering if there's a way you could measure that angle. I yeah, have it. Sensors. You could put sophisticated sensors in there and then graph it out somehow. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 it's, it's, it is my measurable. Is you would not have exact replication. I mean, you wouldn't, it would vary somewhat. It would be uh, predictably unpredictable <laughs> predictably yeah. uh, general generally predictable yeah. not not exactly now it, it is manufactured you know uh, fairly precise you know the hoops are made on a 3d printer so i got it you know that's fairly accurate the magnet itself is magnetized by the manufacturer so i'm assuming it's a nice but even there could be some non uniformity in the actual magnet uh -huh. rotor um, where i position the rotor on the shaft, you know, how well do I have it centered? So there, there is some um, act, you know, errors that could get into the system that cause a little bit of wobble, or a little bit of offset. Yeah, I, but, I wouldn't necessarily call it error. It's just the fact that uh, it, it'll react at different points. And if it reacts just half a millimeter differently at one time, it's gonna make a very different pattern after that. Yeah, well, yeah. And, the, and the material, the material isn't equal across its mass either. So that's another problem. And yeah, you've got all little, different it, axes. The axis, each axis turns a little bit. Uh, it's going to have a different response because you have three different axes. You know, from dependent. What do you call that? The gyroscope. So, and then hey, you, you know, put put seven or eight uh, gyroscopic uh, things. You know, hoops in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, I, what I did find was I, I played around with different types of gyroscopes or gimbals. I guess maybe another way to describe it. And in fact, I started by using th that four hoop apparatus I showed you a couple of weeks ago, where yeah. it uses four hoops with a 60 degree offset. And it has more degrees of freedom of, of spin. But when I was using that type of setup, it was more, it would always, almost always get into a tight spin with very little precession. It, it didn't have that funky spin to it as much as when I converted to the simple three hoop 90 degree offset and so i think that the, the design of the gimbal is actually influencing it's a function that influences the pattern of it so it it has some containment or some constraint on movement so that when normally when the magnetic torque is applied it's going to make the rotor spin very fast it's on a nice bearing and that's the first choice it's going to make because it's easy to spin around that bearing. But if it's lined up where the torque now is 90 degree offset and it's working against the axis of the rotor, then that's going to. And that, that changes the friction coefficient by, by where it's turning. I mean, yeah. not perfectly friction free. So uh, even, and the friction is variable. That's my contention. It's variable depending on the angle that's it's a hit. Yeah, how, how much torque is being applied to it's going to cause right. more friction. 
Right. It'd be nice if you could put that into a into a vacuum belt. That whole apparatus into a vacuum belt. And what I wanted to ask you, what influence does a shell have on the performance of the system? The, the plastic shell around it? Um, I, I don't know. You know, I there's if, a, if you could suspend that, if you in a in a vacuum bell, if you could suspend it without the outer shell, it'd be interesting to see how the system worked then. Because I think that the shell could be an impedance or it could be contributing. Yeah, well, the, the shell acts like, you know, a third hoop, right? So it's really, it's just a mounting place for, for, for a rotation of that green hoop. Um, but yeah, I'd like to have a, you know, an experiment on the space station, you know, zero, zero gravity, you know. So, so who do we know that works for NASA? Yeah. I, I, I don't know, but the cost of sending something up is about to drop off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> They're about to be able to take yeah. stuff up easily. I, yeah, that's I really think that would be a very worthwhile experiment in space because you're really dealing with the effects of gravity on the system and we're not accounting for that in some of the motions that we see or behaviors that we witness. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be totally self-contained where the shell can contain, you know, the amplifier. Like the audio, audio amplifier itself, it's just, it just can run off a small little transistor, and you know, uh, it, and it, it's very low power. Like when, when this thing is running, it's only probably consuming about, you know, two or three watts. So it's an extremely low power design. But I'm not sure what what an application. Well, would be used for. I was going to ask that's you know can it can it accept torque? Uh, do what you know what to a limited degree it can, but the, the problem is that you, you can't access the router to get by the hoops. I mean, you, you really can't. It would get in the way as soon as you extended the rotor beyond the shell. It's going to start jamming up, right? But but you know, if you look on some of my other videos, what I can do is I can couple another magnetic rotor to it to pick up the rotation so you can actually have adjacent and, and, and extract it externally with other spinning magnets right so there, but it, it wouldn't be designed for any kind of high power high torque requirements it's if anything it, it might just model behavior of spinning magnetic fields and it might just be a simple usage that you know if you look at a magnetic field inside our sun Right, there's a lot of complex, you know, magnetic fields going on there. Is it, would there be some natural tendency to kind of mimic a spinning magnetic field? And what I've showed is there just some relationship that, you know, you could predict now, you know, where solar spots are type of thing or, and, and that's the first question is, It'd be, it'd be great to visualize what's going on in a magnetic field as it's sort of, you know, what does a spinning magnetic field look like when it's, when you got multiple fields spinning, right? You, you got the rotor spinning kind of randomly. You got the external magnetic field created by the coils also spinning kind of chaotically. What's the net result when they, you know, when they interact with each other? Can you model? Can you model the magnetic fields uh, with software somehow to to help represent what they look like? I, I would think somewhere like NASA or you know like some, some research universities. I, I would assume that they may be looking at stuff like that. I mean, if, if they're predicting what a magnetic field of a neutron star looks like or the sun, you think they'd have, be able to some way of simulating that. Um, well, yeah, and here's but, here we're dealing with more than one object creating the field. Well, maybe that's what's going on in the sun too, right? There, there could be some sort of, uh, you know, little loops of magnetism that just kind of are all self-contained and mingling with each other. Um, and there should be some structure with that, right? So if there was some, you know, spinning magnetic loops, I, I assume there's some structure would have to obey. Perhaps that's what sunspots actually are, is those spinning fields dissipating and coming to the surface, and they dissipate. Yeah, yeah, exactly.
Yeah, other than that, it's just a novelty toy. But you know, it's. Uh, I saw a video on Jupiter last night, and one of the things they showed was that Jupiter has two magnetic fields, one enclosed inside the other, and they seem to be going in opposite directions. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's so. See, this that's kind a... of suggests that sort of a model. Yeah, it was Maybe. flowing from north to the equator. It's flowing from north to, north to the equator and south to the equator, rather than the other way around. Yeah, but but Jupiter has these humongous magnetic fields, and it makes uh, some of its moons. It sort of pulverizes them. It mu massages them. There's this one close moon, Io or something, and it's getting constantly getting pumped by the magnetic field of Jupiter. Well, it stretches. Yeah, it's like silly putty. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's why it's so bolted. But they, they obviously have software for modeling the magnetic lines because that's what they are showing on the TV. So somebody's got that kind of software. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't doubt it. Well, we have to figure out where we would find that person and how you put a call out for somebody who knows that, how to use those kind of systems to model the magnetic fields that you're creating so that we can see them operating in three dimensions. Well, I assume that NASA has such, such software and I assume that various astrophysicists have it. Guys who do, you know, simulations of uh, uh, formations of galaxies and things. I throwing that on my to Google list. Yeah. Yeah, we have an Oracle. If you probably Google it, you can probably find software that does magnetic field lines. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first part of it should be fairly straightforward because I can visually see what, what the, how, how the magnet's spinning. I mean, that's yeah, a, as yeah. a visible phenomenon, they can actually now map that onto a spinning field. Um, the trickier part is what is the coils doing? Well, yeah. yeah. Like there's, I, you can't visualize that. You can now speculate that if you know exactly where the magnetic pole is on the rotor and, and which coil it's interacting with, you might be able to all right, predict what it's picking up and what it's driving out on the output of the amplifier. But you wouldn't pick up any transformer effect unless you modeled it. Like so if, if, if uh, I am right that there's a, some... It, it, it would be a Taurus, wouldn't it? I mean, each of the coils, right? The magnetic field would really be seem like a Taurus, wouldn't it? Um, well, maybe in, in a general sense, but but its intensity and amplitude could be very irregular. But it, yeah. it, would, right? it wouldn't just be a simple sine wave that you get in a two coil motor. Um, in fact, you know, and I've actually designed the coils kind of specifically to be to kind of like almost like a torus. And the main interaction is not when it's at the center of the coil. It's when interacting with the edges of it, where all the bulk of the copper is. So it's it does interact mostly when it's offset from the center of it, and it could intersect at at, at any point or along the perimeter of the coil. And then the resulting output, you know, it's not going to look like a clean sine wave. There's going to be a lot of a lot of stuff going on that 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 waveform. And you know, and if, if I am right that there's some transformer effect, you know, one motor coil, in, in this case, would, would influence three other generator coils, right? So, 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 so one pulse on that one motor coil could cause three pulses on, on different um, generator coils. Now, those three generator coils are going to take that pulse and drive three other magnets at the same time, and an adjacent um generator coil is going to see the result of three different motor coils influencing it so it get that really runaway feedback um it's hard to predict what it's going to be you know maybe it, it sounds like it'd be chaotic but it may result in a predictable pattern just like we saw 
the hoops move in a very predictable pattern once it starts getting in that steady state. What made now, you decide to do this with on the faces of an octahedron rather than a cube or a tetrahedron? Yeah, I wanted to ask that. Too. Or have you Wait, tried those other forms? I, I I have tried those other forms. Yeah. Um, this is was I, I started off with a cube. Okay. Then I went to tetrahedron, and then eventually I went to this octahedron. Is that is that is that because it gives you more interesting motion? Yeah. Yeah. So the cube and the and the tetrahedron don't do as many different motions. Yeah, well, my first attempt with the cube, um, there was just a lot of thumping around. I mean, it, it, was, it was a lot of. I had to you know strap it down tight because there's there a lot of change in direction, or it was a lot of momentum, angular momentum. Yeah, spun off yeah. instead of. Fed, fed back. Yeah, it's, now I, it could have been just that particular configuration that I had, you know, where I had the coils, you know, a number of things could explain it. Um, and I just evolved to this eight coil design. Um, if I had more time and I, I, I've got a, a 12 coil design I'd like to use based on the dodecahedron. Uh, yeah. 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 You know? Well, or the rhombic dodecahedron, either one of those two. Yeah. Um, to be done but again that's you know time and effort that uh i'm waiting for a rainy day for that one i guess so um, have have you done two tetrahedrons kind of interfering with each other it's kind of cube like but it's not at the faces um sh show me that you, you had something you sure this, this had it had uh see if i can hold this right where you've got one here and then three underneath it and then you've got one on the other side and then three on the other side of, of, of these. That like, like like two nested tetrahedrons. Yes. Well, what what he's got is he's got the eight corners of the cube really. Yeah. Which is yeah. That's... to the octahedron. Yeah. yeah. So no, but I think the way I can answer that one is depending on where I put the generator coils and the motor coils. Right. I'm doing that. Yeah. So in some cases, I, I'm taking the four motor coils. Put it on one of those tetrahedrons, mm -hmm. and then the four generator coils on the other set. So that that's yeah. yeah. So so have you done? So you've got the the basically it's one of the other nested in behind three of the other. Yeah. So and, and now the other configurations like I could take four coils on one face of the square. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another one where you can actually get two coils around the edges so i think there's three different configurations that would, that would make sense up over and down yeah, like uh yeah I, yeah i i'd be really curious if the because because i think the the nested tetrahedrons create a a, a, a balanced space in in the middle I, i've been kind of curious about those effects yeah i i started with actually that exact configuration the one you're referring to that that, that seemed a natural because it's nice contained, right? You'd have yeah. four coils evenly sort of- Pull and pushing. Yeah. Um, Did it settle? The second, Did it lock? The second one I tried with, with the square faces. So then it's more or less like one big mortar side, one big generator, mm -hmm. which I didn't think of that interesting, but I'm getting the best, some interesting results um, with that configuration for some reason. Uh, so yeah, so I, I've, I've played, with all those three different configurations, but it, it gets even more complicated because even in any one of those configurations, I got to pair up one generator coil, one motor coil, and I could pair mm -hmm. them up with any one of the other four. I, I don't have to. I don't have to pick. I got. Let's say if you take four motor coils on on a square face and the other, you know, I, I I've. Four different ways of pairing up a motor coil with a generator coil, either the di diagonal down or an mm -hmm. adjacent. Right, so just okay. What's the difference between your motor coil and your generator coil? I don't understand the distinction. Okay, well, if you if if you, if you think of it as simple, that like the very beginning of the video, I showed two coils on the top and bottom of right. the plastic shell. So in that case, one is a motor coil and one is a generator coil. And they hook up to an amplifier, like an audio amplifier. The generator coil is what picks up as a magnetic pole 
passes in close proximity as it's spinning, that induces a current in the generator side. So now that goes to the input of the amplifier, you know, like coming from a stereo, like you know, your turntable, then it's amplified and driven into the motor coil to, to create a strong enough magnetic field now to attract the rotor to it. Okay, the, is it, the motor coil is driving the magnet? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, it, it typically it won't start unless I give it a hand start. Right. Like if I just turn the power on and it's not moving, it, it won't move. It just stays idle. I got to externally start the spin. And then once it starts spinning, it's self feeding back on itself. The faster it spins, the more current in the generator coil, the more generating more current in the generator coil, the bigger the output is on the motor coil. And, so and that, it this will... is a this is a feedback loop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. After you take the shell away from the uh, from the energy source, or you remove the system from the energy source, how long does it continue to act? Continue action. Like spinning just on its own. It, it goes for quite a while. I mean, there's ceramic bearings. They're, they're, they're quite, you know, they're, they're quite good. Um, it, it's also a function on how, how heavy that the magnet is, right? So the bigger the magnet, the more momentum it's going to have, and it'll spin longer the bigger it is. Um, this, you know, a smaller magnet with less mass, you know, won't spin for more than maybe 20 seconds. <clears throat> Some of the bigger magnets could spin for a couple minutes. In space, it would probably spin nearly indefinitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if I could be suspended in a magnetic field on top yep, of that, right? yep, so yeah, it, yep. it would, yeah, if the, if friction yeah. gets in the way. Yeah, right. You'd only have to apply starting energy one time. Right. And the system would produce its own indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. Can you move a magnet around the system to get it going? How do you, what's yeah. the way that you start it? That's exactly what I do. I, I take an external magnet and I just flip it. I just, you know. So it attracts and that's what starts the system yeah. operating. Yeah, it doesn't need much. Just, yeah, I, I, I can't get my hands into it. I got to give it an external flip right. of the magnet. Yeah, awesome. You know, that's amazing stuff, Gary. I'm always intrigued that you're, experiments very very interesting yeah there's a you know very numerous different ways that this simple motor really i mean a, a lot of this stuff is all involved in a simple audio amplifier motor that, that that's all it's going kind of a feedback loop <clears throat> and you can apply it in many different ways so right? there's you know initially i just started with a stationary rotor like a, a classical magnet and just playing with, you know, what gauge of wire, to, you know, I, I can change the speed of it by changing the gauge of wire. You know, the, the thicker the gauge, the faster the thing is going to spin. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to control the, the rotation speed and as, as well as the shape of the coil. I mean, you, you can get some coils that are very tight and tall, very focused pole or wide and spread out like like the ones I showed you here. Um, some of the coils I just make in a spherical shell, so to kind of, you know, cover even more of the area around the, the spinning motor. Would help to explain in a certain way why some stars are rotating so quickly. Is it perhaps, you know, they were a part of that magnetic system that you developed there, and because it is a runaway, has a runaway effect, they spun up so quickly that it, it, otherwise it's hard to understand how they could revolve on their axis, you know, thousands of times, yeah. you know, a minute. Uh, it, there has yeah. to be a reason. There had to be an initial force. And so I was curious while I was watching the your, your diagrams there that it, it might help to help explain why some of those heavier objects in space have such rapid rotational periods is because they were spun up by that magnetic configuration that you're trying to illustrate there. Yeah, and once they start going, they self-generate their own fields and can be sort of perpetual to some extent. 
That's right. They're in a weightless environment. There's very little to impact on their actions. So they're just going to keep going forever. Well, yeah. until they until they decay. Well, and if, there, if there's not enough energy and heat or radiation just to keep things moving, it you know, it, it won't be the classical perpetual motion with you know with zero energy, but if it's just some local source of energy. It could self generate its own magnetic field to keep its own magnetic field spinning, right? If it if it was in space and slightly slightly out of balance, so the, the kind of the field it was creating was was focused outside of itself. Could it? Could you make a? I wonder if you could make a reactionless drive of some sort. Yeah, like you've got you've got you've got the angles of, of course contained within, but the one where you said it, it started to go crazy. If that if that instead of just totally feeding inside is locks on something outside and focuses at a point, and you have something there for it to to focus against. Because I saw how they were trying to do the reactionless drives, which is basically with microwaves making a focus point to in a closed space, and and they they weren't having a whole lot of luck with that. But they're also just doing it directly. They're not. They're not looking at a, at nested fields and and such. Yeah, I, I, there is a, a lot of interaction between. You, you could two different systems coupled with each other, or you know, or one could drive the other. And there, <clears throat> there's actually numerous ways to kind of combine forces between various spinning objects. Um, you know, <clears throat> I, I started working with, with some basic amplifiers, and, and I. It had like a um, a subwoofer output, and uh, mm -hmm. the subwoofer output really is encoded on the left and right channel of an input. So, so now I, I can combine two separate um, electric waves or you know sine waves or, or, or signals from two different motors spinning and merge them together through the subwoofer channel to drive another motor with a combination of two others right so you can combine these electrically quite easily um harmonic is it harmonic you know i i i, I could not tell I, I i i just knew it sort of would find some sort of steady state of you know at the time i thought it was a chaotic reaction i but once it was in that i i had you know four different of these motors a little different design in fact but I, I, it'd be in similar effect. So the four different motors were in proximity to each other, so they influenced them physically. But the amplifiers I had connected was I had the generator coil from one system feeding the amplifier of another system, so like kind of a chain reaction. So, you know, spin in one motor, drove with the motor coil in a different one, and that was linked to the other one, but they're all physically in proximity. Just like galaxies, just like galaxy clusters. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it would. And the only thing I can play with was just the volume control on the amplifiers. And if I got the volume at a certain, you know, certain uh, adjustment, boom, it would just sort of just run on its own randomly, almost like it's communicating back and forth. It wasn't very controllable. I mean, if I tried it again, I'd get a different sort of pattern again. But it was just. It was just fun to play with that feedback mechanism, both you know proximity feedback of the magnetic field and electronic merging with a simple amplifier. It, it would be neat if you could attach laser a laser emitter on the axis on and and watch the laser display. Yeah, the pattern, yeah. right? That would be another yeah. way to sort of model See, the field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so no, it's just a, it's a fun little toy to play with. Um, but have, I, I, have you thought of putting it on a scale and seeing if the weight changes up well, and that's down? That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. You know, little tiny anti gravity machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. I, I, if you notice on a previous video, I took one of these plastic shells, you know, to, to, it's, it's, it's kind of watertight, and I can just put that in a floating water container. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if you saw it in an earlier video, but it, you know, these things can be submerged in water and give a little bit more freedom of movement. Does it bob up and down? Yeah. I think you're onto something. 
yeah, there, there's so many different directions that this could be, you know, some, some of the objects are very obscure and very esoteric. Um, but there might be a little, a little bit of something there somewhere that someone may uh, be able to recognize a use for. I'd love to get into some university research lab and just see what uh, where they could take this. They might not have as much imagination as you do. True. Yes, right. Yeah. Or determination. Yeah. Yes. I love the nested field aspect of it, of it being a very yin yang to itself, a push and pull. And and then it's like that, uh, I forget what it's called in computer science, where it's, it's as a regressive, very recursive. Where the Recursive. Recursive. Yes. The variable yep. depends yep. on the result of itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so, you've, so you've turned it inward that it is um, that that even though you have energy running the amp system itself, that's not the system. It's running the it's 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 running it's powering it, but its actions depend upon itself, whether or not they're harmonic or progressive or balanced internal or external. It's yeah. it's, it's but feet and the and the fields at the, the 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 nests of fields is a really neat it's just very cool yeah and the fact that it results in some pattern some, some repeating pattern what, what i found interesting and, and, and another way to, that i've looked at it is you know, you know what ohm's uh, not ohm's law but uh i forgot the name of the law now when, when you move a magnetic field your conductor is going to create a, a force in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I can't think of the name of that. But anyways, so, so we, when you you're spinning a magnetic field, the, um, it's going to create a force that's going to slow down your movement, right? So, so it it it, it actually um, is that reactant um, an inhibitor inhibitor. Inhibitor action. Yeah, I don't know if you, if you take like a, um, a solenoid, you know, like an electric solenoid. So when you en energize a coil, it's going to, you know, suck in. Yeah. Um, and if you move it, you, uh, as you're moving that bar magnet, it, you're creating a field in the coil that's going to oppose the the um, the force. It is you know, induction, it, right? Yeah, it's a form of induction. Um, I'm not explaining it properly because I, I can't think of the name of the, the very basic law. But what, what, the, what the amplifier does is it just eliminates that law and, and allows a, a feedback loop between. It's not Lenz's law, is it? Lenz's law. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Good, no, for yeah, you. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Lenz's law is why you don't get free energy from a spinning magnet in a. In a you know, ah, heck. <laughs> Right. Otherwise, you'd get that perspectual emotion. Yeah, yeah, looks good, good on paper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lenses law said, "Well, you know, you, you don't get any free energy here, but by inserting an amplifier, you're overriding lenses law, and now it's it's a clean feedback between moving electrons and a moving field, um, a moving magnetic field that takes the two electric and magnetic forces and allows them to create create each other, right?" The moving magnetic field causes the moving electrons, and moving electrons causes a field to move the magnet. So, so it's that nice little feedback loop they can demonstrate with a simple audio amplifier. So you could, so you could actually regulate the number, the RPMs. Yeah, you, you could by changing the voltage on the amplifier from six volts to eighteen volts. It just got speed control. Yep. Um, now what you should do is run that signal to a loudspeaker and listen to the vibration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, yeah. Uh, I, I've done that. It makes a pretty loud. Um, Feed it into a water pool. Water pool uh, uh, speakers, and they have a thin layer of. There's a thin layer of water that lays across the top, and you apply a signal to it, and then look at the design that you know that's created the structure that's created from the vibration. Yeah, yeah. They're very interesting shapes, unusual shapes. You would some of them are like snowflake shapes. They're they're called Schladney patterns. 
Is that what it is? Yeah. Well, they're pretty interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Very 